In our class of the tafsir of the Quran to the seer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we're going through the tafsir, the explanation of the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala by relating it to the seer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you find every time we go to an ayah related to the what? The seer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in those days, the main focus would be on the Quran, but related to the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there will be weeks in which we'll concentrate upon the seerah, the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So for the last few weeks, the focus and the emphasis has been upon the Quran, but we're still related to the what? The seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, so far, when it comes to the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we've reached the hijrah, the migration of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Mecca to Medina. And we said none remained in Mecca except for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr Siddiq and Ali and a few of the weak. So therefore, the ayat, the verse which you're covering is going to be ayat Makkiyah, Meccan verses or Meccan surah. And for the benefit of the brothers who are new to the class and inshallah ta'ala for the brothers who attend also we define what is a Meccan surah or a Meccan verse. Ya Mus'ab. For the benefits of the brothers who are new and from the benefit of yourself as a revision, what is surah Makkiyah? What is a Meccan surah? Jazakallah khairan. It's a surah that was revealed before the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even if it was outside Mecca. And Surah Madaniya is a surah that was revealed after the hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even if it was outside Medina, even if it was in where? In Mecca. So long as it's after the hijrah and it happened, and it happened anywhere, but it's after the hijrah, it's still what? Madaniya. Even if it happened in Mecca. Who could give me an example of a surah which is Madaniya, was revealed in Mecca? From the seerah. Who could give me? And it's uh, revealed in Mecca. Ida jaa Nasrullahi wal Fath. Ah, Barakallahu feek. Another surah. Naam. During the Treaty of Hudaybiyya, Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina. This was the conquest, or during the Treaty of Hudaybiyya. Is revealed in Mecca, but it's Madaniya. It's a, Mad, a, a Madani surah. So, so far, the surahs we're looking at are Madaniya. And the last surah we stopped at was what? Surah Al Kawthar, which is the 15th set of verses to be revealed to the Prophet. After Surah Al Kawthar, the 17th set, because we're going through it in the order of revelation, not in the order of the Quran. So, the 17th set of verses or surah to be revealed to the Prophet. Was Surah at Takathur Al Hakumu at Takathur. The 18th after that was what? Uh, sorry, the six, this is the 16th. The 17th was after that? Al Ma'un. The 18th after that was what? Al Kafirun. The 19th after that was what? Surah to Al Feel. Surah to Al Feel. The 20th, Surah to Al Falaq. 21st, Surah to Al-Nas. The 22nd, Surah to Al-Ikhlas. The 23rd, Surah to Al-Najm. And the 24th, Surah Abasa. And if you notice, I've gone through the Surah without going through the Tafsir. Why? We mentioned the only ones we're going to stop on are those that there's authentic, not just any narration, authentic narrations concerning Sabab al-Nuzul the reason for revelation and we could relate it to the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So therefore, that which you're going to go through today, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, that has a cause of revelation from all I've mentioned today is Surah Al-Abasa. Surah Abasa. This Surah is Surah Makkiyah because we're still in the Meccan stage of the seerah. Surah Makkiyah, meaning it was revealed where? Meaning it was revealed in Mecca? Meaning it was revealed in Mecca? La, Som, Kali, the fasting is hard today. <laughs> Meaning, it was revealed when, Ya Akhil Kareem? Before the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not necessarily in Mecca, it was revealed, it could be revealed in Mecca, but the core thing is, it was revealed before the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, Surah 2 Al-Abasa. As for the Sabab al-Nuzul, 
of this surah, there are a number of narrations concerning Sabab al Nuzu, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this surah to the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We go to that which is been which has been authenticated for Sabab al Nuzul of Surah Abasa. From that which is related in a Tirmidhi hadith which is Hassan, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha qalat unzilat abasa wa tawalla fi ummi ummi maktum fi ibn ummi maktum al a'ma. This surah was revealed concerning a Sahabi al Jalil. Ibn Ummi Maktoum Al A'ma, the blind one, Atta Rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Fajala Yakul, Ya Rasulallah, Arshidni, Wa inda Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rajulun min Uthama i Quraysh, Fajala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Yuriduan, Wa Yukbil al al Akhar. That this man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he came saying to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulallah, Arshidni, O Messenger of Allah, guide me. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, while he was asking him this, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had with him rajulun min ulama Quraysh from the big personalities, the big leaders of the Quraysh. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam turned away from him, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam turned to the leader of the Quraysh to give him his attention. So Allah subhanahu wa taala revealed the ayah abasa wa tawalla, and this Sahabi ibn Ubi Maktoum continued to ask the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. From his great etiquette, subhanallah. He didn't blame the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but rather he said, "Atara bima aqulu baasan." Is there anything wrong with what I'm saying? Is there anything wrong with what I'm saying? In another narration, he said, "Uthama u Quraysh." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not was just one person from the Quraysh. It was with the Uthama, the great leaders of the Quraysh. When Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum he came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In another narration. He said the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He mentioned the ulama of the Quraysh, the great leaders of the Quraysh. Was with them, Utba ibn Rabi'a and Abu Jahal ibn Hisham, wa Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, and he was giving them attention, and he was hoping that they will become Muslims. And then Abdullah ibn Maktoum, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, asking. He said he was asking the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam an ayah min al Quran. He was asking the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam about a verse in the Quran, saying, "Ya Rasulullah, alimni mimma alamak Allah. Teach me from that which Allah subhanahu wa taala has taught you." So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam aarad anhu wa abasa fi wajhihi wa tawalla. He frowned, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he turned away. Jayyid. So he said he was revealed concerning this, and he said after this incident, after the revelation of this. كان يكرمه. After this, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to really, really, really honor Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum. And just a short thing about this Sahabi رضي الله عنه, which is known as Al A'ma, the blind one. Because the word the blind it comes in the Quran Al A'ma. ليس على الله سبحانه وتعالى when it comes to jihad. They said there's some people there's no compulsion upon. على المريض. Upon the what? The one was ill. It doesn't have to find the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what else? وَلَيْسَ عَلَى الْأَعْمَى And also the what? The one that's blind. But this Sahabi al-Jaleel, Ibn Hisham, رحم الله تعالى, in his seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says about Abdullah ibn Maktoum, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made him participate in the battle of Uhud. Despite the fact he was blind. And not only in the Battle of Uhud, it was said about Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum, he participated in five battles. Ghazawat is not a harb. Ghazawat is the war with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He participated in five wars with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Battle of Uhud, the Battle of Lihyan, the Battle of Zay Qurad, the Battle of Banu Qurayza, and one of the most severe battles ever. The battles which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Balaghat al qulub," that the hearts out of fear, he reached Hanaj, the throat of the Sahaba. And which battle was this? The Battle of Khandaq. Even though he was blind, Abdullah ibn Maktoum, ibn Ummi Maktoum, radiyallahu taala an. So in this surah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala begins with "Abasa wa Tawalla." Jamahir al Ulama, nearly all the scholars say the one Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is speaking about here, "Abasa wa Tawalla," frowned and turned away his wu. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, jayid, because from what we've read, 
the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was with the ulama of the Quraysh, hoping for the Islam from authentic hadith. And Abdullah ibn Umar Maktoum, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And the reason the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was hoping for the Islam of these people, it's not for any dunya reason. Why? These people have atba', they have followers. So when you have great personalities and leaders of communities, when they accept Islam, by default, nearly all or all of their subjects do what? They accept the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was concentrating on them, not for the sake of them per se, but for the sake of their what? Their subjects also. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, Lo amana ashra min ahbar al la amanit al -yahud. If only 10 of the higher priests or the scholars of the Jews accepted Islam, all of the Jews will accept Islam. And you find this present even to today. That, for example, I saw a video, some brothers went to Kenya to give da'wah, and they went to a tribe known as the Maasai tribe. The chief accepted Islam. He said, Ashadu an la ilallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And all of his subjects automatically, they accept the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam concentrated on these leaders and he was eager for their Islam, not for any dunya reason that they're rich or the aristocrats, but rather so that they're subject to accept the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a reality. And that's why the argument that will ensue between the people of the hellfire and the, amongst themselves is that they'll say to their leaders what? Inna kunna lakum taba'a. We will follow us unto you. So majority of people, they follow their leaders. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was hoping for the Islam of these people. So Abasa is talking about who? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But here Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is talking to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through Jibreel. So it should be Abasta wa tawallayta. You frowned and you turned away. But they said this is itabun latifun. This is a gentle correction and a gentle telling off from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the difference between Abasta, you turned away, وَتَوَلَّيْتَ and you frowned, and Abasa وَتَوَلَّى he frowned and he turned away. So it's a gentle, gentle tarbiyah, nurturing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet sallam. And that's why it comes in a hadith, and hadith is da'if, but the meaning is authentic. أَدَّبَنِي Rabbi, my Lord, he gave me adab. فَأَحْسَنَ تَرْبِيَتِي And he gave me the best of morals and ethics. But فَأَحْسَنَ تَرْبِيَتِي means it was done upon gentleness. That Allah Ta'ala corrected the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how? In a gentle and in a soft manner. To the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reach that peak. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You have the highest character. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ And this is a lesson for us also in correcting people. That sometimes you speak in a third party form. For example, there's a habit or a sin or bad thing that become prevalent amongst members of the community you know their name. You do not say in the mimbar or the khutbah to Jumu'ah, don't be like Abdullah over here, he does such and such. Don't be like such and such a person, he does such and such. But rather the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam will say, ma ba'lu qawm, what is wrong with the people that they do such and such? He knows directly what he's speaking about. But ma ba'lu qawm, but you don't say, what's wrong with this brother over here? I saw him last week doing A, B, C, D. It shows the gentleness in tarbiyah. The asl of tarbiyah is softness. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna rifqa ma wudi'a fi shay illa zana. That gentleness is not applied to anything except it, it beautifies it. And harshness is not applied to anything except it makes it shana. It makes it ugly and disfigure it. So this is a gentle correction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abbasa wa tawalla. He frowned and he turned away. Now, does this contradict the fact or what we mentioned before, which is wa inna ka ala khuluqin azim that you have the highest exemplary character? La, there is no contradiction. Why is there no contradiction? Because this person that came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if we were speaking and we're in a conversation, and this happens with our children, what do we automatically say? Can you not see I'm talking to somebody? Can you not what see I'm talking to somebody? But this person, he couldn't see. So what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have done is not even to indicate, but rather to speak. That can you come back later? Can you not see I'm busy? But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't want to say anything that would harm him. He said nothing. 
And even the frowning, could he see the frown of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? لا. So he's not affected by this. The turning of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, did he know about it? لا. Until Allah subhanahu wa taala revealed it. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, ala khuluqin azim. Because a blind person normally, you speak to them in speech. But the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam just frowned and he turned away. But yet Allah subhanahu wa taala still would not accept that, even though he's blind. Allah Ta'ala would not accept that. So imagine now, subhanallah, a person that could actually see us and is in our presence and would actually frown, subhanallah. This is a person I couldn't even see. Imagine a person ask you something. The one that asks, not be harsh. They say, Sa'ila is not only one that begs, even asks him religious questions. Like, and he could see you. Abbas wa tawala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still will not accept that from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Abbasa wa tawalla. An ja'ahu al-a'ama. Da abbasa wa tawalla. An ja'ahu al-a'ama. Da because al-a'ama, it came to him. Who is al-a'ama in this surah? According to the scholars, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. We find many a times names of sahaba or names of individuals they're not really mentioned in the Quran except for a few times so the person is Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum and what is he's a man so why not an ja'ahu rajul an ja'ahu ahaduhum because some will say again does this not contradict the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa la tanabadu bil alqab do not refer to each other by nicknames do not refer to each other by aliases so it's not something praiseworthy. So the blind one, the deaf one, the one that's got a squinted eye. So is this, so they ask, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lowering or debasing the level of Abdullah ibn Maktoum by referring to him as what? Al-A'ma, instead of Ja'an Ja'ahu Rajul. The ulama, they say there's three explanations. They said, in kana ala sabila ta'rif ala bas, to refer to somebody with a physical characteristic or physical defect for the purpose of specific identification, there's nothing wrong with it. If there's no other way out, you're describing brother. For example, I say the Nigerian brother, for example. There's many Nigerian brothers. I say, okay, the brother with a beard. Uh, there's many brothers with a beard. So you say the tall brother, for example, or the blind brother, for example, or the brother that's got a squinted eye for the purpose of identification. So it goes back to the intention. There's nothing wrong with it. To identify somebody specifically. And that's why the ulama al hadith, they say one of the issues in where there's no backbiting in is to mention someone's physical deformity or if there's no way to identify him except by mentioning that. Or somebody's tall, Salim al Tawil, Sheikh al Tawil, the tall Sheikh, if you're not doing it to bring him down. Secondly, and ja'ahu al a'ma. They say it's to prove the point again. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ That the Prophet ﷺ has the highest character. Why? Because some of the kuffar, they try to use this against the Prophet ﷺ. But the one that came to me is what? أَعَمَّا He's blind. فَإِنْ عَبَسَ وَتَوَلَّى Even though he frowned and he turned away, the blind person was not affected by this. Thirdly, they say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يُقَدِّمُ الْعُذُرِ He put forth an excuse to raise and elevate Abdullah ibn Maktoum. Because normally when people are speaking and to cut them off, it's rude. But to show, and Allah Ta'ala put the excuse forth for him, A'ma, he's blind. Abdullah ibn Maktoum radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, an ja'ahu al-a'ma. That because al-a'ma, he came to you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the next ayah, wa ma yudhirika la'allahu yazzakka. And what make you know? لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّى And here there's a pronoun. Maybe he will become purified. And this he, who does it refer to? Abdullah ibn Maktoum or the one the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was speaking to. The scholar said both. It could be any of the two. دَا عَبَسْتَ وَتَوَلَّيْتَ You frowned, you turned away. And what make you know, if he refers to Abdullah ibn Maktoum, that by you answering that question, يَزَّكَّى, it become purified. Or you frowned and you turned away. And what will make you know? The one that you're giving your attention to and you waste your time, now you're zakka, you not become purified. So it said it could refer to any of the two. So abasa wa tawalla. And this shows that the anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have sagha'ir. 
They could fall into minor mistakes, errors, and sins, but they do not continue upon it. That's the difference with the MBR. That they commit minor sins, but they repent and did not repeat the same minor sin. Even Hajar even brought to Ijma that the, the Anbiya, the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they fall into minor sins. Ijma, consensus. Now, Abbasa wa Tawalla, because people do not have this aqidah, some of the people say Abbasa wa Tawalla is who? They say it's Uthman radiallahu an. The Uthman radiallahu an, who Abbasa, is the one that frowned wa Tawalla and he turned away. And this group of people are the Shia. This is the aqidah or the belief of the Shia. The one Allah Ta'ala is speaking about in this ayah is Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an. And what made them have this belief is the aqidah al fasida That's why we say belief and creed is very, very important. The aqidah. And the aqidah of the Shia, or the belief of the Shia, it goes against what we mentioned previously. They say, al imma ithna asha. There are 12 imams. They don't commit any major sins, no minor sins. They have no sahu. What's sahu? Sahu is a form of what? Forgetfulness. So you have after the salah, if you make a mistake, sujood, a sahu. The sujood of forgetfulness. Jayid. And how do we learn about the sujood of forgetfulness? How do we know about the sujood of forgetfulness? True the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How? Once he led the salah and he prayed how many raka'ah? Two. So if this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what about your 12 imams? So he prayed two raka'ah. So Sahab went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, you prayed two raka'ah. He said, no, I prayed four. He said, La. He said no. You prayed two. And this was Sahabi directly saying this to the Prophet. But yet, it's not arrogant and said, Me? He turned to the Sahabi and said, How many did I pray? He said, you, They said, You prayed two. You know, because he asked first, Has the Salah been changed to two? He said, No, it's still four. He said, You've forgotten. You definitely forgot. So they believe there's no Sahu for the Imam, an Imma. There's no Nisyan, no forgetfulness at all whatsoever. And they don't fall into any sins, any error. But then they presented with a problem. When they go to the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ Adam disobeyed his Lord. How did the Shia deal with this? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Musa, what he did to his brother Harun. What did he do? He took him by his, by his head, بِرَأْسِهِ يَجُرُّهُ إِلَيْهِ When the Yahud, they decided to worship the Adam, and he came back and he found what they did. He took him by his what? By his hair. And he took him by his lahi and he dragged him, Musa alayhi salam. So they presented with this. They presented with saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where well, Allah ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa لِمَا تُحَرِّمُوا مَا أَحَلَّ اللَّهُ لَكَ Why do you make haram that which Allah ta'ala made halal? So the only way out for them, the Shia, they say, A'imma. They're 12 imams. They are equal to the Anbiya or a little bit better. And some of them say the Aimma Itna Asha, the 12 Imam, they're better than all the Prophets. The 12 Imams. Except for who? The Prophet. They couldn't say the Prophet said, except for the Prophet. So because they say except for the Prophet, Abbasa wa Tawalla is who? Uthman radiallahu anhu. He has to be a Sahabi. And why did they choose a Sahabi? It's like Imam al Shafi'i rahimahullahu ta'ala, he said that if you also ask the Jews, who is the best of the people after Musa alayhi salam? They'll say the companions of Musa. If you were to ask the Christians, who is the best of the people after Isa? They say Hawariyun, the disciples of Isa. If you were to ask the Shia, who are the worst of people? Asharrun nas. Ba'da Muhammad, they say Ashabu Muhammad, the companions of Muhammad. Subhanallah. So this Aqeed al fasid secondly, because of their belief concerning the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they hold this. So for them, this is ta'nun, is to disparage Uthman. But it's a praise of Uthman, because he shows there's a person people are coming to and asking questions. So Abbasa wa Tawalla is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. An ja'ahu al-a'ma wa ma yudhrika la'allahu yazzaka. Now, there's a lot of lessons that we could learn from this or these three ayat. One of them is, the first lesson is, as concerned and as eager we are for great personalities and rich people to accept the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't mean you ignore, or you abandon the core foundation. And the core and the foundation is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana yuhibbul masakin. He loved the poor people. And anywhere you go in the world, 
you find the majority, firstly, of people that accept the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are who? The masakin. The majority of the people upon the sunnah are the masakin. And due sometimes to a lack of education or where they are from, they're also the most likely to be duped and fall into shirk and fall into kufr and heretic beliefs. So if you go to some villages, for example, you find people have some weird aqidah, the poor people. Yes, they're very, very vulnerable and susceptible to these things. So this is where your concentration should be. And even though they're susceptible to those things, they're also very susceptible to what? Accepting the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Majority of the people that accept Islam upon the sunnah are the masakeen. And this is the sunnah of Allah azza wa jal. And that's why every single prophet, what would the people say to them? Nobody follows you. They'll say to the prophet, the mushikeen, la yattabi'uka illa illa ladhina min aradilina, aradiluna. Nobody follows you except for those people that are from the lowest of us. Badi on illiterate, uneducated people. They don't want that follow you. So therefore they'll make conditions. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would sit down, around him is Bilal Rajallah and Suhail and the Masakeen or the Sahaba or Du'afa, they say, No, we cannot sit with you while these people are with you. Allah Ta'ala said to him, Wala taturudi ladina yaduna rabbahum bil ghadati wala ashi yuriduna wajha. Do not expel them. Huh? Be patient. Be patient with those who call upon the Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Patient how? Patient with characteristics. When you belong amongst lower people, or lower class people, less educated, you are going to see things. You're going to feel things that is not going to make you very comfortable. So for example, you go to the rough areas of London, Brixton, South London, where I'm from, or you go to some rough areas of Nigeria, deep down Lagos, what they call Isaleko, and you see the harshness and the behavior of some of these brothers, but be patient, because they have a lot of goodness in them. And that's why when they saw the, uh, the Bedou, they accepted Islam, and the people kept complaining to Abu Bakr about the harshness of this Bedou, he said, don't worry about it. Maybe their harshness, they'll use it against our enemies one day. Be patient with their poverty. Be patient with their wanting and their asking. Be very, very patient. Be patient with them. So never abandon these people for the sake of others. There's some kind of da'wah now that you find some people who only give da'wah to middle class people, the upper class people, and you abandon the other people. Now, the basis of your da'wah, those who are already with you, do not abandon them for anything. Your brother is always better than the non-Muslim. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Anja'a wal a'ma, that although is a'ma, yazakka. He will become purified. Meaning, you might be blind physically, but internally, spiritually, he's got eyes. Abdullah ibn Muktum. The other lessons bi Allah ta'ala from this surah, because this surah moves on to one of the topics of surah al makiyyah which is the affair of the hereafter. Inshallah ta'ala, we look at the part of the surah that talks about the affairs of the hereafter. Thereafter that bi Allah ta'ala we look at the build up to the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So the week after next, I think we still got a class the week after next, right? Inshallah. We'll go into back to the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa We'll look at the important events of that led to the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa because before the hijrah, they planned to kill the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We look at that and how all the different tribes that got together to strike him with one blow. And now the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam escaped that makr. And then after that, I think after Ramadan bi idnillah taala, we look at the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the awwalu ayah al madaniya, the first madani verse to come down upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Subhanakallah bihamdika shadu an la ilaha anta astaghfir.